hello, and welcome to the College of Psychic Studies Tuesday evening lecture series. Tonight, Tuesday the 26th of June 2001, we have Colin Wilson giving a talk entitled The Atlantis Blueprint. Please note, the lecture may continue on side two of this tape. Sorry? Oh, are they? <laughs> That's my son. <laughs> uh. <laughs> In the uh, 1998, the chap who wrote this book about the possibility that the South Pole, uh, Antarctica, was in fact Atlantis, Rand Flamath, contacted me and said, would I be interested in working on a book with him? I thought this sounded a very good idea because he's a splendid researcher. And when he... Uh, began to present his material to me, I could immediately see that we were really on to something very important. Uh, Rand had become interested in the question of Atlantis years before. He's a librarian in Canada. When he was out of work, I was looking around for another library job, and the idea occurred to him that it might be a good idea to write a novel about Atlantis. And he said that uh, he happened to hear a song on the radio about Atlantis, a kind of pop song. This made him feel that, you know, he was being pointed in this direction. And so, uh, he began to study everything he could find about Atlantis. Now, uh, the first thing he came across was this book by Charles Hapgood, which was called Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings, and which I was talking about at lunchtime. Uh, Hapgood was an American professor of the history of science at a small institute in New England. Uh, during the war, Hapgood had worked um, in the original version of the CIA, which was called something else in those days. And uh, then he became a professor, and he um, immediately became fascinated by this question of Atlantis, simply because... A student said to him, uh, what do you think of Atlantis and um, Lemuria? So, how good said, I don't know, go away and research it for me. So the student came back with a great wadge of stuff about the two. Hapgood read these. The student had come to the conclusion that there wasn't really anything in Lemuria, which was supposed to be the great continent that sank in the Pacific, but that... Plato's account of Atlantis sounded extremely interesting and basically authentic. So, Hapgood then began to think in terms of the question, how could a continent, as Plato had described, disappear in a day and a night? What kind of catastrophe could have happened to the Earth that shook it so badly that it, a whole continent, which, according to Plato, was somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean, that is, beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which are the Straits of Gibraltar, how could that disappear? And so, Hapgood began to research this whole question. Well, his first thought was that he'd already um, studied this question of the Earth's crust because he was deeply interested in geology, and he knew that the Earth's crust is a layer about 40 miles thick that covers the whole Earth and which floats on a sea of stuff called magma, which is basically the molten stuff that comes out of volcanoes. And therefore, the Earth's crust could, in fact, slip quite easily. In fact, if something struck the Earth heavily enough, it could push the crust, so to speak, quite a long way. Uh, now, one day... In his kitchen, Hapgood had shoved some stuff in the washing machine, in the drying machine rather, and uh, when it began to dry, it was all in a bunch, and it spun in the way that 
dry as dew when they've got stuff all in a bunch that is made a terrific racket and rocked the machine and actually tore the boats out of the floor. So Hapgood then had this sudden inspiration. Um, the earth itself, of course, spins exactly like a washing machine. Was there, in fact, a possibility that what had happened was that the earth itself had had, so to speak, a big bunch of washing jammed in a corner of it, and it had shaken like mad? Well, he um, researched this and discovered that the continent of Antarctica um, is this enormous thing the size of America, but that the center of it is not at the South Pole, so to speak. So in theory, as the Earth goes on spinning like that, this that vast continent, which is sticking out a bit on one side, and which is made of ice two miles thick, could quite easily have caused the washing machine effect, and in fact have caused the catastrophe of Atlantis. So he got a friend of his to help him research all this. The friend was a mathematician. But the friend said, nope, that's not the answer. In fact, he said, um, you could put ten times as much weight on Antarctica, misdistributed, and it still wouldn't produce the washing machine effect. So that was the end of that theory. But he still continued to think in terms of what might have happened to Antarctica. Now, what he found out as a student of geology was that the rocks in the Earth's crust, uh, particularly iron rocks, have all their atoms, all their molecules pointing, so to speak, like little arrows in one direction. And if something actually happened, that's because the pole, which is, of course, magnetic, pulls all of these little arrows pointing towards it. Now, if the pole had changed its position, then, in fact, the arrows would now be continued because the iron's gone hard, pointing in the direction of the old pole. And this gave him the clue that he needed. Uh, what he found was that, in fact, there is lots and lots of iron ore in the crust of the earth, which is now pointing um, much too far south, so to speak. In fact, this stuff in the Earth's core, in the Earth's crust, is pointing towards Hudson Bay, which is around about 2,000 miles south of the present North Pole. Now, you can see that it's the, um, the North Pole is in the, the Earth, so to speak, underneath the crust. So what you would have to do, in fact, if you wished the, uh, to shift the Earth's crust 2,000 miles south would be to grab the crust like a schoolboy's cap and push it right on the back of his head. Well, he began to study the geology of the Earth to see whether this was plausible. And in fact, it proved to be very plausible indeed. If at the moment you draw a line around the Earth, around the South Pole, you discover that it is exactly like a kind of lopsided schoolboy's cap. I mean, a line, you know, a line where the atoms, where the molecules all point towards the pole. It's like a lopsided schoolboy's cap, which seems to imply that, in fact, the Earth's crust has slipped. Now, the more he studied this, the more he discovered that not only has the Earth crust slipped, and you can date things fairly precisely from these, uh, from these rocks, these um, magnetic rocks, what he found was that the great slippage had occurred round about 10,000 BC, which is when Plato said the great catastrophe had occurred. Now, most people thought that Plato's idea was nonsense, basically, because what Plato says in the Timaeus is that um, the Atlanteans were a great nation who had a tremendous civilization on an island. Uh, Atlantis was the central city of this island, and there was a great plain around it. And he sort of described all this in detail. I mean, it really reads like the first science fiction novel. And Plato went on to say that... Uh, the Atlanteans had become 
increasingly, he doesn't say wicked, uh, increasingly sloppy and bored and inattentive, so to speak. And that the gods finally decided, and then the sequel to the Timaeus ends, halfway through a sentence. So, interesting puzzle. Did Plato invent the whole story? Um, if uh, he invented it, why did he invent such an extremely complex story, such a precise story? Lots of people have looked at this and said, no, this does not read like invention. Now, in fact, Plato's great-grandfather, Solon, who was a Greek statesman, had been in ancient Egypt and had talked to Egyptian priests. And the Egyptian priests had said, you Greeks are like children, you don't know a thing about history. It extends far, far further back than you would ever dream. And in fact, they had said that it extends back to Atlantis. So, you can see why Plato was so totally convinced of this whole story. And that, of course, is why Hapgood, in turn, thinking, well, Plato's not going to invent this just for the fun of it, not after writing all those dialogues with um, Socrates. He decided there must be something basically in all this. That's why he became so fascinated by the subject of Atlantis. Now, he published a book called, Map, uh, called um, Earth's Shifting Crust, and he got into, cons <coughs> into correspondence with Albert Einstein. And Einstein was fascinated by this theory and said, this sounds to me very interesting indeed, and I'd certainly recommend you go ahead and write the book. Unfortunately, Einstein um, died before Hapgood had finished writing the book, but he had written the introduction to the book. He wrote it as a kind of booby prize for Hapgood because he tried to get Hapgood a grant um, from um, the American Scientific Association or something of the sort. And unfortunately, this um, bastard who invented the hydrogen bomb, what was his name? Um, anyway, whatever his name was, he intervened and prevented Hapgood getting his, uh, his grant. And so that all fell through, and Einstein, feeling very uh, uh, sorry for him, what was the name of the chap who said, brighter than a thousand suns? Oppenheimer, yeah. Um, uh, the atomic bomb. And uh, so um, Einstein wrote the preface, as, as I say, a kind of consolation prize. The book appeared, and um, Hapgood immediately got a tremendous amount of flack because all the geologists said, this man is not a geologist, and what he's saying is nonsense. Academics are always like that. And uh, so, Hapgood felt, you know, well, anyway, I've done my best, and that's it. But he went on researching it nevertheless. Now, one day, any of you were here at lunchtime, I apologize for repeating this, one day he was listening to the radio, and he was coming from Georgetown in Washington, and they had a debate about a map which had been found in um, an institute in Washington called the Piri Rice map. And Piri Rice was a Turkish pirate who'd been executed around about um, 1531 or something of the sort. But he'd been um, fascinated by ancient maps. And what he'd done is to take a lot of these very ancient maps, which were called portolands. That meant from port to port. And medieval sailors used portolands to move around the world. Now, there were, in fact, a number of sort of so-called authentic maps by authentic cartographers at that time, and they were hopeless. Um, there was one that showed England with looking like a teapot. They, these people obviously just had the vaguest of guesses what the Earth really looked like. But, by comparison, these um, maps, the Portolans, which Hapgood called maps of the ancient sea kings because they were used by ancient sailors, were incredibly accurate. Now, the reason the Piri Rice map interested these people who were talking from Washington was this. The Piri Rice map shows the whole coast of South America, which at that time had not been mapped. We're talking about, say, 1529 or something like that. Uh, that meant that Perry Rice must have had maps that dated back a long, long time. And he'd obviously not done a terribly good job of this because he'd put one major river, something like the Amazon, in twice. 
and uh, made mistakes about the coast. But nevertheless, on the whole, the map was incredibly accurate, so much so that when Eric von Däniken wrote this thing, uh, uh, Chariots of the Gods, he said that the Earth must have been photographed from outer space by spacemen who'd got it so completely right. Of course, they hadn't got it completely right. He got the Amazon in twice. But nevertheless, it was a very impressive achievement. And what's more, at the very bottom of the map, it showed a bit that looked like the coast of the continent of Antarctica. And it showed the continent without any ice. Now, Antarctica hasn't been without any ice for, I don't know, 7,000 years. The last time was probably round about 5,000 BC. We can't be sure about that. And it showed things on the coast of so-called Queen Maud's Land, showed bays and all kinds of things. Now, what startled everybody so much in uh, this institute in Washington in Georgetown was the fact that recently a geographical survey of the North Pole had used radar to penetrate the ice and found that all of these bays were really there underneath very, very thick ice. As I say, ice in Antarctica can be two miles thick. So how on earth had geographers succeeded in penetrating two mile thick ice to see the shape of the bays underneath? Now, you must understand that um, writing was not invented until around about 3,500 BC by the Sumerians. And there's no point whatever in having a map without any writing on it. And so, almost certainly, somebody knew the world at this date, and what's more, knew about writing. And so, Hapgood was so fascinated by this that he wrote to the Library of Congress and said, have you got any more of these porter lands? And they said, oh yeah, we've got a lot, come and see them. So Hapgood went along, went to a room about the size of this room, and it was covered with great big trestle tables, and they laid out these porter lands for him to look at. And uh, he looked through these things and was staggered because he discovered that the porter lands showed all kinds of things about the world that appeared to date back way before Alexander the Great. Most of these maps were probably originally in the Great Library of Alexandria. So, it appeared, for example, in one map, um, made by a man called Orontius Phineas, around about, I don't know, 16-something, that Orontius Phineas knew about the South Pole when it did not have any ice at all. And he'd obviously constructed this from much earlier maps. For example, he showed a great crack across the middle of Antarctica with no ice. Well, that crack really exists under two miles of ice. But nobody knows about it because the ice covers it completely. It showed mountains in the middle of Antarctica and rivers and so on. And so, as far as one could see, somebody had been in Antarctica around about five or 6,000 B.C., and had, in fact, mapped the whole of the interior. Now, who would map the interior of a continent as big as Antarctica unless the people who lived there? You wouldn't bother to do it if you were just a sailor sailing around it. Now, that's why Rand Flamath, who wrote the Atlantis blueprint with me, was so fascinated because it suddenly struck him, surely Atlantis was Antarctica. He said, Plato describes it as being beyond the pillars of Hercules, but you have to realize that's beyond Gibraltar, but you have to realize that if the Earth crust had slipped 2,000 miles, which is the distance between Hudson Bay and the present North Pole, then Antarctica is also going to be carried 2,000 miles south and to, into a much colder zone. This is why Rand had this idea that, in fact, Antarctica is Atlantis, which still strikes me as, you know, an extremely plausible hypothesis, in spite of the fact that I quarrel with the bastard for reasons I won't tell you about. Well, you know, maybe I will tell you about them later. But anyway, my wife's hissing at me and shaking her head. Um, <laughs> uh, so... Um, Hapgood 
was so fascinated by this whole business that he proceeded to study the Perry Rice map. And he discovered that on the Perry Rice map, right opposite the mouth of the Orinoco River, there is shown on the sort of Europe side of the map an enormous island which looks indeed as if it's big enough to be Atlantis. Uh, you know, Plato gave the dimensions of this thing, and it's pretty big. And then uh, he looked at various other of these ancient maps and discovered also that this island was also on them, a map by a chap called Philip Bouache, for example, was about 100 years later. So obviously this island really had been there, and so Hapgood said, this thing must be Atlantis. So I had a good look at it, and I uh, thought, now, where precisely would that be nowadays? And he had a look at a modern map, and quickly found that there are just two great big rocks sticking above the sea called the rocks of St. Peter and St. Paul. Uh, and it's quite a tiny island, about two miles long. But Hapgood came to the conclusion that probably what lies below the surface is Atlantis itself. When Atlantis sank, these things were left sticking out of the surface. Now, he was tremendously excited by this idea, and he went along to a friend of his who was interested in these anomalies called Ivan Sanderson, and said, have you got any ideas where we can raise some cash to uh, go and look below the surface of the Atlantic there? And uh, Sanderson said, well, I know Walt Disney. Maybe um, he'd be willing to send a kind of expedition along to make a film. Anyway, Hapgood then suddenly remembered that, in fact, um, he knew this new guy who had become president of the United States called John F. Kennedy. So, since he'd been in the former CIA, he contacted Kennedy and said, could he come and see him? And Kennedy said, yes, yeah, sure he could. And uh, so, for a while, Hapgood thought, we made it. Kennedy's going to lend me the American Navy <laughs> to go and look for Atlantis. <laughs> Unfortunately, somebody decided to shoot Kennedy through the head in Dallas two days before Hapgood's appointment. Uh, so the whole thing fell through. Anyway, um, Hapgood nevertheless uh, went on persisting with this idea of his about the rocks of St. Peter and St. Paul. But unfortunately, never getting anywhere. He just could not. He thought, you know, well, I'll give up my work as a professor happily and go and look for it in the Atlantic. But um, nothing ever came of it. So anyway, um, he more or less gave up all this. Eventually, he gave up his job at Keene State because he was rather fed up with a sort of attitude towards him, which was typical academic, <coughs> and feeling that, you know, he was much too far out. Finally, he resigned and went into retirement. He re remained very interested in all kinds of weird matters, and I'll tell you about that later. But um, anyway, he um, went on working on this problem of Atlantis until my friend ran Flamath. No longer my friend. Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> um, ran Flamath wrote to him about Atlantis and said, you know, well, I've been doing some research and all that. Um, in South America, which does appear to indicate that there was some enormous catastrophe, which seems to have been uh, around about 10,000 B.C. He said, and you find this again and again in Canadian Indians and all people over um, North America. It is quite clear that something really major happened. And anyway, Hapgood was delighted to have a defender and wrote back and said, you know, he found Rand's... Um, essay on all this, extremely interesting. Rand was so interested that he decided he would come and research this in London at the British Museum. So he and his wife moved to London, and he continued to correspond with Hapgood, and uh, he came up with a lot more stuff about the legends of South America, which did appear to indicate some giant catastrophe around about nine or 10,000 B.C., and he kept more or less in touch with Hapgood. Now, what happened was that um, around about um, late 1981, Rand dropped a letter to Hapgood telling him what his latest researches were revealing. And Hapgood wrote back to say, I've just come across the most amazing stuff that has completely shattered me. He said, I'm going to put this in the new edition of Earth's Shifting Crust. He'd already done one edition of it called The Path of the Pole, 
because they discovered that actually the Earth has had three different North Poles in the past 100,000 years due to these magnetic particles pointing to the North Poles. Hapgood said, I have discovered proof that civilization is 100,000 years old. But 100,000? I mean, Rand thought at first, you know, maybe he hit one typewriter key too many, and he meant 10,000. <laughs> But he reread the letter, which is extremely carefully typed, said a hundred thousand years. And he said, what's more, a civilization with a fair level of achievement. So Rand was staggered by all this, and he wrote back, quick, tell me, tell me, what? And his letter was returned, stamped, deceased. Hapgood had stepped in front of a car and been killed. So this was the puzzle that Rand was left with in 1982. What did Hapgood mean by a 100,000-year-old civilization? Anyway, he continued to brood on this, and he was a kind of slow worker being a librarian, and uh, <laughs> like my bibliographer sitting at the back there. And uh, he um, went on for quite a long time studying Atlantis until finally he came up with this book, um, which was called When the Sky Fell, which was all about legends of the sky suddenly falling in and terrific catastrophes that filled the atmosphere with thick black and sulfurous smoke and so on and so forth. And you get these all the way through America, through the American Indians. So, um, Rand uh, had produced this book. Now, I explained this morning that what had happened to me was that Dino De Laurentiis, who's a film producer, had asked me to write a script about Atlantis. And Dino had said, uh, you know, try to produce something original rather than, you know, old men with white beards and girls wearing bikinis. So I then remembered that I'd read a book by a man called John Anthony West, which had come in 1979, and it was called Serpent in the Sky. And what John had said in this book, in the last chapter, it was entitled Atlantis, uh, Egypt, Heir to Atlantis. And he said that he was pretty certain that, in fact, the civilization of Egypt had arisen much too quickly for this to be historically possible. You know, Egypt first appears in the records around about 3000 BC. By 2500, they're building the Great Pyramids. Rand thought, this is impossible. A civilization takes far longer to get off the ground. It doesn't rise as quickly as that. You know, think of, let's say, you know, France with Chartres and that kind of thing. It takes a while to develop and so on. You know, in, in the case of France, let's say, um, back to the year 1 AD. So, beyond John's basic position was the feeling that Egypt had, in fact, been around for much, much longer than anybody thinks. And he then came across a maverick Egyptologist, a Frenchman called Schwaller de Lubix. Schwaller had been a fairly rich man. And in Egypt, he discovered <clears throat> such interesting stuff when he'd been um, looking through the evidence of the temples and the pyramids that he'd become fascinated and he decided to stay in Egypt and just study one temple, the Temple of Luxor, which he did for about 10 or 15 years. And wrote a giant book in three volumes about the Temple of Luxor, which he discovered, was that he claims, is actually basically shaped like a man. And he claims that different parts of the temple represent, so to speak, the human body. Now, John West came across um, this giant book, The Temple of Man, and decided that um, this sounded authentic. But what interested him was a casual comment that Schwala de Lubix threw off in his final volume, which is translated as Sacred Science, saying that you've only got to look at the Sphinx to see that the Sphinx was quite obviously um, not weathered um, by wind-blown sand, which everybody claims, but was, in fact, weathered by water. Now, water does not fall all that often on Egypt. You do get rainstorms and all that, but on the whole, it's sort of fairly rare. And the Sphinx, as you know, is pretty badly weathered. And what Schwalle had said instantly was, you know, this is definitely water wear. And so John 
having written this book, Serpent in the Sky, had decided the next thing he'd got to do was to take an archaeologist or a geologist to Egypt and have a good look at the Sphinx and tell him whether this was water weathering or windblown sand. Well, he got hold of um, a man in Boston called Robert Schock, and Schock was interested in this story, a very young geologist. But Schock said, look, I've got my um, tenure coming up next year. I daren't go before then, because I probably wouldn't get tenure if I produced anything really controversial. But as soon as I've got tenure, I'll come with you. And so, 18 months later, Schock said, OK, I've got my tenure, I'll come with you. So he took him to this Giza plateau, thinking, oh, my God, have I made some terrible mistake, which he's going to point out to me. But Shock looks at all this stuff and said, yep, you're quite right. That's water weathering. You can tell the difference instantly as soon as you look at it if you're a geologist. He said the point is that windblown sand weathering wears the surface of a rock, and he was talking about the Sphinx enclosure, which is the kind of three walls around the Sphinx. He said, well, wear it, uh, the soft rock gets worn inwards and the hard rock stays outwards so that the profile of the rock is like that. He said, now water weathering, which is rain coming down from above, hits the rock, flows downwards and cuts little channels in it and it still wears out the, um, the soft rock in between, he said, but it's quite different because you've also got the water channels from above. And he said, they make the rock look like a series of baby's bottoms, so a little these little um, round things. And he said, look, you can see it all the way here. And I've looked at this myself, and it's true. It's definitely rain weathering and not windblown sand. And John said, well, why hasn't any geologist ever noticed this before? And Shock said, well, I guess no geologist has ever looked at it with that kind of interest before. And so John presented all this or rather, shock had to present it at a meeting of the some American Geological Association in 1991. Discovered his great surprise that the geologists themselves were tremendously enthusiastic about all this. The archaeologists shook their heads and said, "Impossible! You couldn't possibly um, have rain weathering in ancient Egypt." And besides, when John had said to Shock, when do you think then that the Sphinx was originally created? It was supposed to have been created at the same time as the Great Pyramid in 2500 BC. Shock had replied, well, I don't know, say 7000 BC. So he'd more than doubled the age of the Sphinx. And this created a tremendous furore. And John wasn't even allowed to t take part in this. All that happened is that a number of Egyptologists jumped up and said, look, if the Sphinx was around from 7,000 BC, there must have been a civilization around as well. You show us a single potsherd that illustrates the existence of this civilization. And John replied, you know, well, look, I've shown you this evidence. Don't sort of ask me if we get more evidence, which we haven't yet found. If there is evidence of this civilization, it lies far below the surface of the desert sand. Now, John had a very good point there. One of the very puzzling things about the Sphinx is this. Next door to the Sphinx, there's a thing called the Sphinx Temple. There were once two of them on either side of the paws of the Sphinx. And the only one that remains is this temple built of giant, enormous blocks, which are placed with great precision. Now, a modern uh, building firm would not know how to build the Sphinx Temple. The blocks are too big. You wouldn't be able to do it, even with a modern crane. You know, there's sort of 200 tons or something like that. So how did the ancient Egyptians raise blocks of that size? Now, there's one great difference between the Sphinx Temple and all the temples that you probably know if you've ever been to Egypt. You know, these great temples, those huge round columns um, like um, Luxor and so on. Uh, and that is that these, the Sphinx Temple was very bare. Later temples are full of all kinds of interesting carvings and all kinds of things. Not the Sphinx temple at all. Now, um, in the temple of Ramesses II, uh, which is much um, further south in the Nile Valley, in fact, there is a recording 
by an ancient Greek geographer of an ancient temple. And they'd never found this temple. And so, round about 1905, a geologist began to dig around there, and sure enough, came upon evidence of a temple called the Osirian, which is built of these same huge square blocks. And this was behind the temple of Ramesses II. And as soon as they'd actually cleared away all of the sand above it, it promptly filled with water. The water sort of came up from underneath, so it looks like a swimming bath nowadays. But it's built in a completely different style from all the other Egyptian temples. Now, the first um, comment people made was, well, it was built by Ramesses II at the same time as his later temple, which was, you know, maybe 1300 or something um, BC. But in point of fact, although Ramesses II's name appears written a couple of times on some place he built outside the Osarian, you have to remember that the ancient pharaohs were very inclined to claim any nice-looking building as their own and lost no time in sticking their names on it. In fact, there are no recordings of Ramesses II inside the Osirian. So, John said, look, the Osirian is probably... I mean, it was buried under the sand for all those years and nobody even knew it was there. There's probably lots and lots more stuff buried under the sand in Egypt. And all we have to do is, you know, be lucky enough to come across it in the way that we came across that, the Osarium because of a reference in Strabo. So, um, John's theory was more or less um, thrown out. But at that point, I learned about it by a very odd means. Dino had asked me to write um, this idea about Atlantis and I happened to be in Tokyo at the time, and I mentioned this in the press club in Tokyo, and a nice chap called Murray Sale, who was my host there, said, oh yeah, I saw something about that a few weeks ago. And I said, can you dig it out for me? And Murray said, well, I'll try. He thought he'd seen it in the New York Times or something, but he couldn't. But anyway, a fortnight later, I was in the press club in Melbourne. I drift from boozer to boozer all over the world. That's where I got this. And... Uh, I mentioned this to the editor of a Melbourne newspaper who said, oh, I, I saw it too. And he came along with this piece about John West and Robert Schock and this whole business about the furore caused by this idea that West had put forward. Now, at this time, by total coincidence, I received a letter from John West. I'd never been in touch with him in my life before. And um, suddenly, West wrote to me and said, are you interested in the business of the Sphinx and the Pyramids. And what he sent me was an article that he published in a magazine. This chap, Mark Lehner, who was the one who had said that he was all nonsense and who was a member of the Giza Plateau Authority, Mark Lehner, who, the chap who would said, you know, just produce me one pot shirt and I'll be convinced. Um, Lehner had said, and besides, the Sphinx face doesn't look in the least like the face of the pharaoh... Uh, uh, sorry, it looks exactly like the face of the pharaoh Chephron. They'd found... Um, a statue of the Pharaoh Chephron in the Sphinx Temple, and it's now in the Cairo Museum. Uh, now, John took a look at the statue of Chephron in the Cairo Museum, and then he took a look at the Sphinx, which is pretty battered, as you know, and said, you know, they're not in the least alike. So what he did was to get hold of an American forensic um, artist for Frank Domingo, whose business was to look at battered corpses that had been dragged out of the river, and make sketches of the faces based on the skulls as to what he thought they looked like in life. So Frank Domingo went along, had a look at the Sphinx, and had a look at the statue of Chephron, who was supposed to have built the second pyramid, and said, you know, um, in point of fact, they're not in the least alike. There's a completely different angle, for example, um, between the ear and the point of the jaw. No, they're not the same person. And so John produced this in this um, American magazine and sent me a copy of it. Total coincidence. And this whole business for me was a series of extraordinary coincidences or synchronicities, which always shows me, you know, that I'm going in the right direction. Whenever things are really going interestingly, I start getting synchronicities as if some fate is tapping me on the shoulder and say, saying, keep going, you're okay. It also happens, by the way, when I'm very cheerful and very happy. And uh, <laughs> when I'm gloomy, it doesn't happen at all. But um, so 
I was quite excited by this stuff of John West's. And be, I was going to um, America a couple of months later. The family were going to America too. So I arranged with John that I would meet him in New York and talk about it. So that's what happened. We all got together with John in New York. He showed me a program that he'd made about the Sphinx, introduced by Heston, and a very impressive sort of program, presenting all his evidence that the Sphinx must surely date back much, much further than anybody thinks. I mean, Shock had said, said 7,000 years, but John's conviction was really the answer is 9,600 BC. And the what had happened is that the people fleeing from Atlantis had fled across the Atlantic Ocean, landed in Egypt, and had built the Sphinx as a kind of memorial of this lost civilization. So, it's not the kind of thing you really dare to say very much about, but Gurdjieff, by the way, in all and everything, does say that the occult tradition claims that the Sphinx was built by Atlanteans. Anyway, we met John in New York, we took him out to dinner, and um, John said, first of all, have you heard of um, this man Graham Hancock? And I said, never. And he said, well, he's writing a book called Fingerprints of the Gods, which is really about this idea that civilization is far older than anybody thinks. Why don't you contact him? I took down Graham's address, and he then said, then there's this other man, Ranfle Math. He said, he sent me his typescript, which hasn't found a publisher, but Rand also has this feeling that um, Antarctica is in fact Atlantis and has produced all these legends to prove it. So as soon as I got back home, I wrote off to Graham Hancock and Ram Flamath. Both of them sent me their um, typescripts. Graham's was a giant fat thing, about six inches thick. Rand's was a rather slim thing. But I was deeply impressed by both of them. And uh, I said to Rand, look, um, if you can get a publisher interested, tell him I'll write an introduction. And a Canadian publisher who was dickering about whether to take it or not said, OK, well, if we get an introduction from Colin Wilson, I'll do it. And so Rand's book finally came out. Graham, uh, who'd been terribly broke at that time, I mentioned at lunchtime that um, he'd called upon me at this time and we'd taken Graham out to tea at a little hotel along the coast. I forgot my wallet and I said to Graham, can you lend me 10 quid until we get home? And Graham said, I haven't got 10 quid. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, the book Fingerprints of the Gods came out and he suddenly got 10 million quid. I mean, just sold and sold and sold all over the world, sold 9 million copies in Japan alone. And, uh, and suddenly Graham was very famous and very rich. Anyhow, I continued to do this and um, I wrote my book, Atlantis to the Sphinx, um, I must confess, stealing, as I always do, um, generously from Graham and from Rand and from anybody else I could lay my hands on. <laughs> and uh, this, you know, as um, the great Lobachevsky said, plagiarize, plagiarize. <laughs> A principle I've always adhered to very closely. Um, anyway, so um, my book came out. I happened to be in Glasgow that day lecturing to the Glasgow Society of Psychical Research. And uh, a nice fellow called Archie Roy there, who um, I'd met years before. And when I said to Archie, um, have we got some copies of my book? He said, we couldn't get any. It sold out on the first day. And so, you know, I, I got an inkling then that things were really flowing in the right direction. And in fact, it sold out three editions very quickly, you know, about three weeks. So obviously, there was a tremendous interest in this whole subject. Now... This was why, when Rand wrote to me, and I by that time had met him and made a program with him, with John West, about this whole question, this is why I said instantly, yeah, you know, I'd, I'd love to write a book with you. So Rand then sent me the stuff that he had produced for this book. Now, what had happened briefly was this. Um, Rand had become very interested in one of the um, major temples in Mexico called Teotihuacan, which is north of Mexico City. And out of Teotihuacan, um, there is an enormously long avenue, which is now known as the Avenue of the Dead. We don't really know what it is. Teotihuacan is extraordinary. I mean, it's far more extraordinary than the Giza Plateau. 
Um, there's this giant pyramid of the sun. At the side of it, there's the pyramid of the moon. I mean, the whole thing is so big that, you know, even with a bicycle, it would take you a whole day to get around it. It's vast. And uh, I was um, fascinated when I finally went and looked at the place. It was quite obvious, you know, that some tremendous religious force had led to the building of Teotihuacan. Now, this way of the dead leads north out of Teotihuacan, but it doesn't lead quite north. It points over a bit that way. And this had fascinated Rand, and more so when he'd, his wife had brought home a book um, by an archaeologist named Anthony Avene, who said that, in fact, there are no less than 49 temples around Mexico, which are all aligned slightly in the wrong direction. So, of course, Rand's first thought was, supposing those temples are aligned on Hudson Bay, and that they were built or planned before the Hudson Bay Pole changed its position and Atlantis went down. So, anyway, he <clears throat> proceeded to work on this, and at first it looked as if he was on the right track. It did appear that all of these temples were aligned on the old Hudson Bay Pole. But then, when he put it on a globe, which is, is of course, quite different, being curved, he discovered it didn't really work out. But he then went on to study sacred sites all over Europe, and found, indeed, that the sacred sites, once again, appeared to be aligned vaguely on the Hudson Bay Pole. And it struck him that maybe, in fact, civilization had been created long, long before we think. That all of these sacred sites were, in fact, basically aligned on what was then their North Pole. Now, the theory he came up with about all this didn't really deeply convince me. His theory was this. He thought that <clears throat> Atlantean scientists had realized that the world was going to encounter some tremendous catastrophe, probably by huge crust movements that caused earthquakes and all the rest of it. And they'd realized they were in trouble. So Rand said that what he thought happened was that a number of archaeologists from Atlantis went around the world looking at various sites and kind of, you know, leaving markers, as scientists do, of the sites they'd examined. And he said that after the Atlantis catastrophe, later people came across these sites assumed they were kind of sacred sites and proceeded to build their temples on these sites. Now, that to me sounded a lot of rubbish. Um, to begin with, sacred sites, as I know, are sacred because of the earth underneath them. It's something to do with the world, the earth itself, the crust of the earth. It seems to have some enormous magnetic force, which creates, you know, what um, Alfred Watkins called ley lines. And the ley lines connect up these sites of great magnetic power and force. And I had no doubt whatever that this exists. Um, uh, for example, um, Joy and I had been uh, looking around in uh, France, staying at Concal, at various um, centers around Karnak, you know, those giant avenues of stones. And still nobody knows why they were built. And we'd been to look at various tombs around Karnak, great mounds, and you went inside them and underground. And during that whole time I was there, I felt absolutely awful. I really felt bad-tempered and rotten, and I kicked joy more than usual. And it uh, really struck me as such a nasty spot that I just wanted to get away from it. Well, one day we were looking at the, the Menia Brise, which is this giant thing that fell down and smashed in several pieces in Karnak, and Joy was trying her dowsing rods on it because she's a very good dowser. And uh, she was getting a response, quite a strong response from the dowsing rods. And on the way back um, to our hotel, we passed a thing in a field, and Joy said, do you mind if we stop and have a look at that? And I, who wanted to get to the bar, said, oh, for Christ's sake. <laughs> but anyway, we went into the center of this field. Joy got out her dowsing rods. There was a cottage in the center of the field, and then these fairly small stones looking a bit, you know, like a smaller version of Stonehenge. Got a lot of them around in Cornwall. And um, she got out a dowsing rod, and she said, my God, you feel this. And I took the dowsing rod from her and walked towards the rock, and it really twisted in my hands. The power under the earth was obviously terrific. And 
When we got back in the car, I said, my God. And Joy said, well, that's almost certainly because there haven't been piles of visitors wandering around it. And it still retains the original strength that they stuck the rock in there to mark. But these things are like needles stuck in acupuncture points around the surface of the earth. And I said, you know, there's poor devils living in that cottage near it. I wouldn't live there if you paid me 10,000 pounds. And uh, then I suddenly realized why I'd been in such a filthy temper for several days. It was this bloody underground force, which was, you know, pulling on my nerves and making me extremely tense. Now, that's why I was totally convinced, and I've tried this, you know, I've been to Stonehenge and tried with the dowsing rods and all the rest of it. I went there on the um, last solstice but one. And um, again, this tremendous force in the stones, which is increasing because visitors are no longer allowed to go and approach the stones. There's a, an enormous underground force. In fact, Stonehenge is one giant whirlpool of force with the stones placed in the middle of it. There's no question of bloody Atlantean scientists. It's definitely something to do with the force of the Earth itself. Now, I was um, fascinated by this whole business, nevertheless, as, because Rand had said enough things that really made sense to me. And the one thing that really impressed me about what Rand had said was this. He'd said, you'll notice that, in fact, these sacred sites appear to be placed kind of symmetrically over the earth, so that you can, you know, in, for example, if you get a certain sacred site a number of degrees north of the equator, then you can almost certainly reckon you'll find a similar sacred site the same number of degrees south of the equator. Then one day he emailed me and said, i just come across an interesting one. He said, we've got this gigantic Mayan um, sacred site north of the equator. He said, and I've looked south at exactly the same latitude and longitude, he said, but the place I've discovered does not appear to be very promising. And he said, uh, well, we, we actually appear to have there. He said, I've looked at the map, and he just said that it's um, some kind of Mexican ruin. Now, as soon as he mentioned the name, which I've bloody well forgotten in my usual stupid way. Um, but anyway, whatever um, he said, he'd come back to me in a second, struck me as amazing, because, of course, this was the place... Um, where a man called Mitchell Hedges had discovered the famous crystal skull of doom. He claimed that his wife, uh, his daughter, in, uh, his stepdaughter, had been there in the temple with him, and she'd seen something gleaming under the altar and had taken out this skull of doom. And uh, he said, you know, other people there with them, the local Maya, brought the jaw of the skull, and this is how they found it. And so I wrote back to Rand and said, well, you really have come across a major sacred site. And the only problem is that Mitchell Hedges was a total liar. And we now know that he certainly did not find the skull of doom <laughs> in this place. But anyway, it deeply impressed me. Because quite obviously it was a major sacred site that he had found there in British Honduras. Sorry? Oh yes, my wife's got it. It was Lubantum. And uh, thank you, darling. And uh, so... I um, became totally convinced that Rand was correct. And so we began work on this book. Now, you can see that the obvious problem was this enormous problem of what it would mean by civilization being 100,000 years old. That was what really fascinated me. And Rand himself didn't feel that was all that important. He felt that if he could simply establish his theory about sacred sites being originally laid out by Atlantean scientists round about, say, you know, 10 or 11,000 AD, and then had been subsequently built on as sacred sites and by the people who lived in that area, um, he would be perfectly contented. But I was fascinated by this idea of the notion, you know, that civilization was 100,000 years old. I mean, you know, that sounded to me preposterous. Because, you know, I mean, our ancestor, Cro-Magnon Man, was only just about appearing around 100,000 years ago. And they certainly didn't have any skyscrapers or anything of that sort. So, anyway, 
I was uh, traveling down the Nile with Joy and looking at a lot of these temples, and this being about 1998, and giving some lectures by way of singing for my supper. And uh, the people in the next cabin said, have you read this? And they gave me a book by a chap called Maurice Chatelain. Uh, the book was called Our Cosmic Neighbors, and at a casual glance looked like a completely nutty book. The usual kind of, you know, visitors from space and Eric von Däniken and all that stuff. And, uh, but when I looked at it, I became instantly impressed. To begin with, Chatelain was the man who had built the electronic system on the first rocket that went to the moon. He'd fixed up the whole of the system that enabled people on the moon to talk, you know, to the Earth, and that enabled Buzz Aldrin or whoever it was to say, you know, a small step for man, a giant step for mankind, or whatever it was. Anyway, uh, what Chatelain said was this. Um, he'd become uh, fascinated by this whole business of um, space science and so on, and he mentioned, incidentally, an interesting thing, which I just threw out as a footnote. He said that it was general knowledge around the space center that the people going to the moon for the first time were followed, followed by UFOs. He said they all talked about this quite openly. And then, of course, um, it was totally denied by NASA. But anyway, um, he went on to say that he'd become particularly fascinated by a stone discovered in Mesopotamia, um, which is now Iraq, in the 19th century. This stone was discovered in a uh, hidden temple. Uh, you know, as you know, people began to excavate uh, Mesopotamia for the first time in the mid-19th century. And immediately discovered that it was as rich, archaeologically speaking, as Egypt. And what he discovered was a library belonging to King Ashurbanipal, who, as you know, was an Assyrian, and uh, who was one of the most brutal men, according to the history books, ever. The Assyrians finally got stamped out by their neighbors because they were so incredibly brutal that, you know, they just wanted to get rid of them. And finally, after a number of revolts, they did get rid of them, and they smashed them so completely that when the Greek legions were um, covering the site, as described by Xenophon, um, about 2,000 years later, they just discovered these he heaps of ruins and said, what are they? And people said, I don't know. And that was the cities of the Assyrians. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, Ashurbanipal had nevertheless been an extremely erudite sort of man, as well as, uh, well as one of the cruelest conquerors ever. And they discovered in his library a number of stones with enormous numbers on them, giant numbers. One number running to 15 digits. Well, the first question was, what on earth were the Assyrians doing with a number running to 15 digits? You know, they couldn't really count, or rather they had to count in sort of the ancient system, which was a bit like Roman numerals. You couldn't really get much beyond 100 without getting confused. And so he began to study all this very carefully, and then he remembered something. The ancestors, the direct ancestors of the Assyrians, were the Babylonians. And the direct ancestors of the Babylonians were the Sumerians, who were the people who had invented writing. And the Sumerians had done a lot of other interesting things. They'd invented the first set of laws. There's a very fine book called History Begins at Sumer, which shows all of the different things that the Sumerians, round about 4000 BC, did for the first time. As I say, writing was just one of these. And um, the Sumerians were the people, for example, who'd put 60 seconds to the minute and 60 minutes to the hour. They'd invented time as we know it. Now, as soon as this struck Chatelain, he thought, is it possible that, in fact, these vast numbers, because there were several of them, are, in fact, in seconds? And so what he did was to settle down and study these numbers and change them from seconds into years. And he immediately discovered a rather curious fact. Um, the Nineveh number, 
when translated into seconds and amounting to more than six million years, was divisible quite exactly by the length of time of the precession of the equinoxes. Now, the precession of the equinoxes for the ancient world was one of these tremendous mysteries that fascinated them. And we know perfectly well now that it's just caused by a slight wobble on the Earth's axis. Um, all you have to do to envisage this is think of a giant pencil stuck through the Earth from the North Pole to the South Pole. And imagine that as it goes um, around the Sun, this pencil, um, because of the gravitation of various other uh, members of the solar system, the pencil tends to wobble a bit. Imagine that the top of the pencil is a searchlight pointing at the sky. Imagine a searchlight pointing at the ceiling. You can see that it would go around and kind of make a circle on the ceiling. But in point of fact, this circle takes something like 26,000 years. Or, you know, it's 25,986 or something sort of quite precise like that. Now, this number of the precession of the equinoxes, 25,000, whatever it is, divided quite exactly into the Nineveh number. This could not be a coincidence, which implied that the ancient Assyrians knew about the precession of the equinoxes. Now, they thought this was something of terrific importance. But don't forget, it takes a hell of a long time to notice that in fact the North Pole is gradually changing its position and pointing different stars. Uh, for example, in the time of the Great Pyramid, um, the North Pole was not pointing at the polar star, our present polar star, it was pointing at a star called Draco, as this searchlight went in a circle around on the ceiling, so to speak. Now, um, as soon as he realized this, he began to look at another number, or rather two numbers, which had been discovered in South America some 4,000 years later, created by the Maya at a place called Quiriga, which was one of their sacred sites. And what he discovered was that once again, once he'd reduced these, actually the Maya counted in days, not in seconds, once he'd reduced these to years, it divided precisely and exactly by the procession of the equinoxes. The Maya knew it too. He also discovered another very interesting thing, and that is that every orbit of every planet in the solar system, Earth, Mercury, Jupiter, Mars, the lot, 6,000 years ago, it became completely accurate. <laughs> so, it looks as if 65,000 years ago there could very well I mean, a civilization that understood these huge figures and understood a hell of a lot more about the solar system than we understood a hundred years ago. This seemed to me to be a very interesting notion and to relate to what Hapgood had said. Now, we wrote to everybody who'd known Hapgood, like his son, for example, and uh, relatives, and said, look, did Hapgood ever tell you anything about what he was doing, about this stuff, about uh, the Earth having civilization 100,000 years ago? They all wrote back and said, no, nothing at all. So I was feeling rather discouraged. And then somebody um, was introduced to me um, by Hapgood's, um, Hapgood's um, half-sister, Beth. And Beth said, why don't you try this guy um, called um, Jonathan, who did know Charles. So I wrote to this chap, Jonathan, and Jonathan said, um, wrote back to me and said, yeah, I knew Hapgood, and, um, you know, I'll see what I can do for you. About three weeks later, um, Jonathan wrote to me and said, I may have your answer. Why don't you get in touch with this guy? I'm not going to tell you his name, for reasons you'll see in a minute. So let's, for the moment, call him Carl. Say, Carl Hergisheimer. He said, why don't you get in touch with this man, Carl Hergisheimer, and um, talk to him about this. So, you know, 
everlastingly eager to try and find out what Hapgood had been up to. One Sunday afternoon, when I'd finished my work, and it was a sort of lovely May day, and I was just about to go down to the sea and have a swim, I thought I'll try ringing this call. So I dialed this number in New England, and uh, this sort of rather pleasant sort of American voice answered me, nice baritone voice. And I explained to him what I was looking for, and I said, so what I'm trying to find is why Hapgood was totally convinced that civilization is 100,000 years old. And Carl said, yeah, I told him so. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, I said so. And I said, but why? What made you say so? And then he went into an extremely obscure um, account in which the only word I understood was metrology, which means measurements of the earth. And he said that it was partly due to metrology. Anyway, Carl was a hell of a talker. He talked for two hours, <laughs> and I missed my swim. And I came upstairs to join. I said, I think I've solved the problem. I have found out why Hapgood thought the civilization is, uh, is 100,000 years old. Because listening to this Carl, he may have been a talker nonstop, but my God, he was obviously also a formidable mathematician and scientist. He could remember all kinds of facts about, you know, the exact orbit of all kinds of planets in the solar system. Um, he'd done this for an edition of Encyclopedia Britannica. And so obviously he knew an enormous amount. And so I was so delighted by this and I said, look, is it okay I'll ring you back and if I record you because I'd really like to understand this. And Carl said, yeah, okay. And so he said, by the way, um, you know, uh, but uh, you'll have to ring me because if I try calling you from America, it's very, very expensive. So I said, OK, don't worry, I'll pay for the calls. So I had a tape installed, and uh, it was one of these British telecom tapes. The only problem was that um, every 30 seconds he went beep to inform the person on the other end that he was being recorded. So anyway, I rang Carl up and I said, you know, I've got a tape. Can you start explaining it to me again? I said, it runs for an hour. Well, he talked for two hours. But at the end of two hours, I'd got a really good account of his basic idea. Now, let me try to explain to you about this metrology stuff. Metrology means measurements of the earth. And in fact, much later I came across a very interesting book by a man called Berryman, A.E. Berryman, who was an engineer, and which had a title like Ancient Metrology. Now, what he said was that Ancient measurements prove beyond all doubt that there must have been a much older civilization. And he goes on so boringly and so precisely and giving figures for page after page after page that nobody had ever read the book. <laughs> but one of the figures he gives is extremely interesting. The ancient Greeks did not know the size of the earth. You know, that is Plato's contemporaries. But the Greeks had a measurement which is called the stada, which is the length of you know, a stadium, which is like a football pitch. When you measure the equator, it is precisely and exactly 216,000 stada. And when you then proceed to divide that by 360 to turn it into degrees around the Earth, you discover that it works out at 600 stada to a degree. Now, that's no coincidence. You can't get a figure as precise as that unless somebody in ancient Greece knew the precise and exact size of the earth. And that's the kind of thing that Berryman goes on arguing. He talks about weights and measures. He talks about a, a sort of giant swimming pool um, found in ancient India, which is precisely 100 yards square. By the way, I better mention this fact right away. should be of great interest at the moment when we're all going metric. Um, all of these ancient measurements are in British miles. <laughs> so we shouldn't have anything to do with the bloody French and their <laughs> kilometers and all the rest of it. Uh, and what's more, um, you'll see um, later, if, I, if there's any later, we're getting terribly near to the time I've got to shut up. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I can go until 9 o'clock. Oh, good, that's fine. Okay, well, uh, yeah, and what I meant was I'm likely to go until 11 o'clock if you let me. 
Um, the, what um, Carl was saying basically was that things like that that I've just explained to you about the circumference of the earth being precisely 216,000 stada show that the Greeks must have known the size of the earth in spite of the fact that Plato didn't think they did which means that somebody way, way back before the Greeks knew the size of the earth and it had more or less come down to the Greek ancestors when they created the stada. You know that um, the French meter is supposed to be a 10,000 to the distance between the poles and it was chosen more or less arbitrarily for this reason. And Berryman says that the same kind of thing goes for all kinds of ancient measurements. When you examine them very closely, you discover that in fact, you know, they do pan out in these very precise measurements. So that's why I understood what Carl was talking about. Well, then he went on to some really weird stuff. One of the things he said was that he was convinced that Neanderthal man, who was around from, say, 250,000 BC until about 40,000 years ago, when we, Cro-Magnons, exterminated him, that Cro-Magnon, uh, that Neanderthal man had a far higher degree of civilization than any of us would believe and knew all about these things that I'm saying. Now, it so happened that I knew about this because a friend of mine called Stan Gooch, um, who's a psychologist and uh, interested in para the paranormal, Stan had also written a book called City of Dreams in which he had explained his view that Neanderthal man knew all kinds of things, including procession of the equinoxes and all kinds of other things. In fact, he'd argued that the Neanderthal man had a culture of a kind, although not a civilization. Now, this, according to Carl, is what he told Hapgood. And Hapgood had been completely convinced by this. And this is why Hapgood had said in the letter to Rand that he'd discovered an amazing proof that civilization was 100,000 years old. Now, naturally, I was delighted because this was really weighing on me. Here was I writing this enormous book. The publisher had commissioned 150,000 words. And I didn't know whether I got the last chapter. I mean, it would be like writing an Agatha Christie novel without a last chapter in which Poirot explains who the murderer is. So I wrote to Rand a delighted email saying, Oh, thank God, we found it, we found it. We found who told Hapgood. And to my surprise and horror, Rand wrote back, I think he's a fake. And I wrote back, no, no, whatever Bart is, and he may talk endlessly and be a total bore on the phone, he's not, I've said Bart, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Forget that. <laughs> um, he's not a fake. Anyway, Rand, to my surprise, really dug in his heels and would not have it. And what he proceeded to do was to investigate Carl and... Uh, to try to prove his point that he was a fake. Now, it was perfectly obvious to me when I'd listened to hours and hours and hours of Carl and paid him hundreds of dollars for these huge telephone calls that he knew far too much to be a fake. I mean, he just knew too much about ancient history and archaeology and mathematics and the planets and all kinds of other things to be a fake. You, you can't be a fake if you know that much. But Rand would not have this at all. And this is what really caused the first sort of major quarrel between us. Because I felt I'd solved the problem that we'd set out to write the book about, and Rand didn't. But nevertheless, we continue to work very well together. <laughs> and uh, until the bastard finally changed my book completely and took all this out, and you won't find it if you buy that edition there. That's the reason I'm so irritated about it. But um, we went on working together, and I must confess that some of the things he said really amazed me. Um, for example, um, he told me about something called Brown's gas, which completely knocked me out. Um, what he said was that this man, um, whose name was, I think, Ivan Belboff, uh, who'd been a theology student in Bulgaria around about um, 1920, had been fascinated by Jules Verne's um, novel, The Mysterious Island, in which somebody says that the 20th century won't have to worry at all about fuel, 
we shall have plenty of fuel and we'll get it by dividing the hydrogen and the oxygen in water. Now, as you know, the law of the conservation of energy says that if you place a lot of energy into dividing the hydrogen and oxygen in water, which is perfectly easily with electrolysis, nevertheless, the amount of energy you use is about equivalent to the energy you would get back if you exploded the hydrogen and oxygen together and used them for driving a power station or whatever. But Velboff apparently didn't know this. And the result was that after the war, during which time he'd become a prisoner of the communists and all kinds of other things, he went on to try to investigate this question of dividing hydrogen from oxygen. Well, once he blew himself sky high with it and got quite injured. Uh, but nevertheless, he persisted. And finally, he invented a thing, uh, a sort of generator. By the way, the reason he changed his name um, from Ivan Velboff um, to Yul Brown was that he greatly admired the film star Yul Brynner. <laughs> although he spelt the name Y-U-L-L instead of Y-U-L. And because the American lieutenant who finally got him out of a Russian prison camp was a man called Brown. So he added these two together. And when he came back to civilization, he called himself Yul Brown. He went on with this generator of his. And, you know, this is completely incredible. What he did was to find a simple method of dividing the hydrogen and oxygen in water and creating a flame which you lit, like, you know, an oxyacetylene flame. And it burned with a sort of blue flame. Now, a friend of Rand's um, in Canada had been along to have a look at one of these things working. A man called um, Mikroson had bought one of these Brown's gas generators. And the first thing that um, he did to demonstrate it to my friend Sean was to point this sort of tiny little flame at a brick and slice the brick in half. It just melted when he pointed this tiny blue flame at it. He then did sort of various other things like welding a lump of iron um, to a lump of stone and all kinds of other things that cannot normally be done by the normal welding process. And then he showed Sean by running the flame up and down his arm that it didn't burn his arm. It was cool enough, in fact, not to burn his arm. So whatever it was doing, this extraordinary flame was causing something much more like a chemical reaction in whatever it touched. Now, Brown was excited by this and was sure it would make him a multimillionaire. And he went on, went to all kinds of people. But as soon as he said, I've discovered this flame that will do all these things, they said, oh, go away. We've had a lot of them. And he just could not get anybody terribly interested. Now, finally... He applied to the Chinese, and the Chinese were very interested in Brown's gas for a simple reason. They were interested because by separating the hydrogen and oxygen in a kind of um, chamber in their submarines and then exploding them so that they recombine making water, it created a perfect vacuum. Now, if, in fact, they did this together with steam from seawater. The steam disappeared completely, leaving salt in the bottom of the chamber. And they were able to get fresh water. And the Chinese were very excited because this meant that their submarines could stand uh, the sea for a long time, creating their own fresh water from seawater using the Brown's gas generator. And so, for a long time, they went on doing this. Uh, the Chinese, I believe, are still doing it. Anyway, finally he succeeded in getting the Americans interested and some big American corporation said, okay, we're going ahead. We're starting to manufacture Brown's gas and it should completely change the face of the 21st century, a new method of creating energy and so on. So they built him this great laboratory and Yul Brown went along to look around the laboratory of which he was to be the boss. And somebody <coughs> sort of coughed delicately and said, there's only one thing, Mr. Brown, you'll have to put that cigarette out. You're not allowed to smoke on these premises because of the American law. And Brown said, but I smoke all the time. And they said, well, I'm afraid you'll have to go and smoke outside. And he said, how can I? I spend all my time standing outside. <laughs>
And they said, look, we're terribly sorry, but, you know, this really is the law. And we can't allow you to be the only one to smoke. And Brown said, OK, stuff your bloody laboratory. <laughs> and walked out, and that was the end. A couple of years later, he died of cancer. So that's the story of Brown's gas. Well, anyway, that story was only told to me for a rather interesting reason. And the reason was this. Uh, in the 1930s, the British team driving along through the um, desert somewhere near Cairo had been driving between giant sand hills, which had actually been there for centuries. They don't tend to move very much when they're that big. I discovered all over the ground a rather interesting-looking substance which looked like lumps of beautiful yellow or green glass. So they stopped and shoveled some of this stuff into their Land Rover and took it back with them to Cairo. Now, this proved to be a kind of semi-precious glass, you know, a sort of um, precious stone. And the result was that they used all of it, you know, they sold it to Egyptian merchants who cut it into beautiful little squares. But, of course, the great question was, where did it all come from? Now, the first guess was that it was tectites. Tectites are things that fall from space, lumps of glass, and as they go through the air, they get hotter and hotter and hotter. And finally, when they hit the earth, they, the earth, they're totally molten glass. And it was assumed that all of this stuff was tectites. But that was rather odd, because tectites usually tend to fall in ones. You don't discover them covering the face of the desert. And so they went back and got more of this stuff and examined it. Then they discovered that this could not, in fact, be a tectite, because as the tectite comes down through the atmosphere, it gets full of oxygen. And the oxygen fills it with sort of tiny little bubbles. Well, examined under a microscope, this stuff just had no bubbles of oxygen, so it wasn't tectite. Well, they were very puzzled by this, and um, they gave a lecture um, at the Royal Society about this stuff, about this Egyptian desert glass. And um, the uh, president of the society, Lord, what was his name, Joy? Uh, gone out of my head. <laughs> anyway, um, the, um, the president was absolutely fascinated by this whole story. Lord Rennell, I think his name was, Lord Rennell of Rod. Uh, Lord Rennell went around telling everybody this story about these amazing tectites and so on, and saying, what do you think is the solution? Now, just after the war, um, he met an engineer who'd just come back from Australia where they'd been exploding atomic bombs in the desert. And the engineer said, oh, yeah, I've seen glass like that. And he said, where? And he said, underneath an atomic bomb after it had exploded. He said, that produces exactly that kind of glass. And so Lord Reynolds was faced with this completely paradoxical idea that they'd, they'd had atomic bombs dating back, you know, maybe 600 AD. Well, uh, he continued to pursue this subject and it was told finally, well, the thing is that you could produce that kind of glass as a byproduct of a kind of alchemical process, but in order to do it, you need a lot of water, just as you do for a hydrogen bomb. And you don't have a lot of water in North Africa. And so... He then got in touch with an expert to ask him, had there ever been lots of water in North Africa? The expert was called Charles Hapgood, who knew an enormous amount about this kind of thing. And Hapgood said, oh, yeah, you had lots of water, giant lakes of it. And around about 6,000 BC, he said at the end of the last ice age, and before all this stuff evaporated, he said, for example, the pyramids were built on a great green plain, not desert like now. It's only become desert over the years, and mainly through animal grazing and that kind of thing. Now, Hapgood himself, when he was told all this, was very fascinated because he had a gold necklace, which was of a gold so extraordinarily pure that it cannot normally be created by any normal process of smelting. And Lord Reynolds told him that he also had one of these necklaces, which he'd found, been found in ancient Egypt. Now, the necklace that Hapgood had seen was, in fact, from ancient Mexico. But the point was that in order to make a necklace like that, so totally, completely pure, you had to vaporize the gold at a tremendously high temperature. 
something like 6,000 degrees centigrade, getting on for the temperature of the sun. And you then let it um, coalesce together again, like you know, water that's been turned into steam and then is um, turned back into water through a Liebig condenser. And uh, in fact, what you've got is this incredibly pure form of gold, which Hapgood had seen. So once again, this possible proof that ancient civilization had some processes that were really so extraordinary we don't even begin to understand them. And it was only when Rand came across um, this a friend of ours, Sean, and saw a pamphlet he'd got labeled 6,000 degrees centigrade and read this stuff about Velboff and his enormous temperatures that can be created by Brown's gas, which is actually at a fairly low temperature, low enough not to burn the hairs off your arm, that he got very interested in this and thought, well, maybe Brown has in fact discovered something very important indeed. Maybe he's discovered an ancient technology which dates back a long, long way. So Shaw went to see Brown and asked him these questions. Do you think the ancients could have had this kind of technology to produce this kind of temperature? And Brown said, oh, yes, yeah, sure, it can be done quite easily. Then went, to ex went on to explain that if you burned um, wood that was partly wet, you got such a tremendously high temperature that dissociated the hydrogen and the oxygen in the water, and you got these incredibly high temperatures. Anyway, this was one reason that um, Hapgood became so fascinated by all this stuff that he heard on the radio. Now, um, the more stuff that Rand handed me, the more I became fascinated by this whole problem. I became particularly fascinated by this theory of Rand's, which, as I say, is that the Earth has a number of sacred sites which are placed at intervals, because I'd always been very interested in this business of Rennes-le-Chateau. Um, as you know, Rennes-le-Chateau is um, a place in France where the priest had discovered a manuscript in a column in his church, an extremely poor priest um, called Béranger Saunier, had taken this manuscript to Paris, to the Bibliothèque Nationale, and then along to Saint-Sulpice, where there was a kind of um, centre of intellectual priests, and had come back from there, and then suddenly become fabulously rich. So rich that he was able to build a road up to Rennes-le-Chateau, was able to build himself the most beautiful tower as a library, and had spent the rest of his life as a rich man, and um, drank himself to death from cirrhosis of the liver, as the French are inclined to, um, at the age of about 50. Um, his housekeeper was asked about this great secret, and she told the person who bought the house that, yes, indeed, she would tell him this secret before she died. But unfortunately, she was um, struck with a stroke that prevented her from speaking at all, and as she couldn't write, <laughs> the secret is now lost to us. So this subject had always fascinated me. Where did he get this enormous sum of money from? And a chap called Henry Lincoln, uh, who was an actor turned um, writer and BBC producer, um, wrote a number of BBC programs about this question of Béranger Saunier and what had happened in Rennes-le-Chateau. And uh, he came across all kinds of interesting clues. He came to the conclusion that this whole thing was connected with a group of people called the Templars. The Knight Templars were some people who had been formed uh, round about um, 1100 B AD in order to um, reconquer the Holy Land from the uh, Arabs and had been for a short time very successful in doing this. They then had managed to get some kind of... Um, some kind of agreement from the king of Jerusalem which allowed them to stay there um, in the ancient temple. The temple which had once been Solomon's temple and which was now little more than a kind of ruin, a series of basements. They'd spent ages in these basements and they said that their business was to defend the Holy Land from pilgrims. But since they spent all the time excavating the basements, it seems unlikely that they did very much help uh, by way of helping the pilgrims. What they did um, was become an extremely rich order, one of the richest orders in France. And so that towards the 
end of the 12th century, they had a huge amount of money. Um, they lent this money out. Uh, this was partly because they were regarded with great favor by the Pope and allowed to pay no taxes, and so they became fabulously wealthy. They became bankers and so on. Then, um, in the early 14th century, King Philip the Fair of France decided that he really wanted their money. And what he did was to get his soldiers to pounce on all the Templars simultaneously. Um, and this was on a Friday the 13th in the year 1307. And various writers have said that maybe this is why Friday the 13th is regarded as um, an unlucky day. Although, you know, it's supposed to be the day of the crucifixion. But um, so this notion that um, Friday the 13th, you know, and the Templars were somehow connected with this mystery of Renner Chateau interested Lincoln very deeply. And he began to investigate more and more deeply. He discovered that around the Rennes Chateau area there were a number of tombstones that Beranger Sonia had taken great trouble to wipe completely clean of the inscriptions. But he then discovered that that didn't make any difference because they'd already been recorded by a local historian who'd shown them in great detail. And in short, what he discovered was that the ancient tombstones did reveal that in fact there was some kind of secret involved in this whole area. Now, Henry Lincoln made a series of programs about this for the BBC. Um, the programs fascinated me so much that I recorded them and watched them over and over again. But then, <clears throat> he went on to write another book about all this, in which he'd made some very interesting discoveries looking at this area of Rennes the Chateau, which Rand had also looked at. He discovered that Rennes le Chateau um, and two other major sites in the area, uh, called Bézieux and Blanchefort, formed a precise isosceles triangle on the map. And he found himself wondering whether since the pentacle was so much a magical symbol, that's, you know, a five-pointed star, whether there were two other hilltops in the area, because Rennes le Chateau and these other two are on hilltops, to form the pentacle. He looked carefully at the map, and sure enough, there were two hills in precisely the right points to make a five-pointed star. And this, he decided, was the reason that Rennes le Chateau was a sacred landscape. Somebody had noticed this fact that the pentacle, this great sacred symbol, was represented on the map of Rennes le Chateau. Why was it a sacred symbol? Well, it's rather interesting. All of the planets as they go around the sun get occluded um, by the sun as seen from the Earth periodically. And if you draw a line from, you know, the points where they're occluded, Mars is an irregular triangle, and the other points are in the same way sort of irregular triangles or whatever. The only thing that makes a precise pentacle is Venus, the planet of love, and the planet of magic. And so, he began to feel that this, in fact, was his answer. Excuse me. That this, in fact, was his answer. That somehow, Ren the Chateau is connected with Venus and with magic. This, of course, made it a fascinating sight as far as Rand was concerned. Now, there's one more important connection that I have to draw before we finish. That is this. At about the time I was working on the book, um, Joy and I went up to Scotland um, to, as I say, um, launch my um, book from Atlantis to the Sphinx. And we were taken along by Graham Hancock's uncle um, to look at an extremely interesting church. What was it called, Joy? Rosslyn which is somewhere near Edinburgh. This church had been built by a Templar long before Christopher Columbus discovered America. The interesting fact is that all over the church, you have, in fact, um, symbols of the... Uh, sorry, I'm getting dizzy having talked for so long. 
I'll sit down for a moment. Uh, he discovered such things as sweet corn, which did not exist in Europe. And uh, the other thing was aloes, I think, which again did not exist in Europe, but did exist in America. This meant that, in fact, whoever built um, this strange church, which is obviously built on a model of the temple at Jerusalem, had in fact sailed across the sea to the Atlantic something like 50 years before Columbus. Now, the answer to this, I think, is fairly simple. What had happened is quite simply that the Templars, some of the Templars, had got word that they were all about to be arrested. What actually happened, of course, is that not only were they arrested, a lot of them were tortured to death and burned at the stake, and they disappeared more or less as a movement. Can you all hear me, by the way, sitting down? Yeah. So, the Templars disappeared, but somebody tipped off a number of Templars in the Chateau of Bézieux. And this may well have been because the closest ally of Philip the Fair, who ordered the arrest, um, was, in point of fact, the Pope himself, who'd been put there um, by Philip the Fair in a sort of bargain. And the Pope himself had obviously tipped off his nephew. And it was his nephew who was in charge of the Templar fleet. The Templar fleet sailed from La Rochelle, their own port, and disappeared completely. I think the evidence is that the Templar fleet sailed to America. Now, the question is, what were the Templars looking at so busily in the basement of Solomon's temple? Now, the answer is very strange. It's a pity we're getting so close to nine o'clock, because really, this is so fascinating <laughs> that as far as I'm concerned, it's the most among, the, uh, among the most interesting stuff that I've said so far. A couple called Robert Lomas and Christopher Knight are Freemasons. They got very interested in Freemason ritual and they came to the conclusion that surely all of this sort of nutty stuff about, you know, wearing a sock on one leg and all the rest of it means a great deal more than appears on the surface. And they began to investigate this. Now, Joy and I on the day um, we went there to visit Rosslyn Chapel, had seen a copy of their book, um, which is called The Hiram Key, and we'd bought it. And I read it on the train going back. And this is really an amazing book. If you haven't read it, you should. Quite incredible. Because what they say basically is this. Jesus of Nazareth belonged, in fact, to a group called the Essenes. And the Essenes were more or less Jewish revolutionaries uh, who turned their back upon the Orthodox Jewish Church because they thought that it was basically corrupt. And they tried to produce a much purified version of Christianity. Now, all the historical evidence is that Jesus himself was an Essene and was, in fact, the head of the Essenes at that time. Now, the other thing which is pretty certainly historically accurate is this. Jesus did not think of himself as a kind of Messiah who'd come to save mankind from its sins. He saw himself as a Messiah in a purely practical sense of throwing the Romans out of Judea. This, he felt, was his central job. And he and his brother James, his younger brother, were in fact the leaders of the Essene sect. Now, Jesus decided that in fulfillment of a prophecy of Zechariah, he would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey and would throw the money changers who were approved by the Romans out of the temple and that this would start the great revolt. Well, as you know, he rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He got arrested a few days later. The great revolt never started. Now, as you know, the Bible story tells you that Pontius Pilate said, 
who shall we release, Jesus or this other bloke, Barabbas? Now, Barabbas is, in fact, not a proper name. It's a name, actually, as a phrase which means merely the son of the father. And Lomas and Knight argue very convincingly that Barabbas was, in fact, Jesus' brother James. So, Jesus got crucified as a revolutionary who wanted to get rid of the Romans. His brother James was able to return to the Essene community and was able to begin to um, create a sort of revolutionary movement. Now, in fact, as you know, the Essene scriptures are known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, these were discovered in a cave near Qumran sometime in the 1950s and have been fascinating scholars ever since. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls um, seem to reveal some very interesting facts, one of which Lomas and Knight write about at length. This interesting fact is this. Christianity was not invented by Jesus, but by St. Paul. St. Paul, in fact, had some kind of revelation. He'd, in fact, been a kind of Roman policeman, a kind of gauleiter, if you like, whose job was to suppress Jewish rebels. Then, for some weird reason, he'd had a revelation and decided that maybe Jesus was okay after all. This was, of course, after the death of Jesus on the cross. And so he had gone along to the Qumran community and said, look, I'm a Christian, I'm converted. Tell me all about Jesus. And they'd been staggered that their enemy had suddenly become their friend and told him all about Jesus. And so St. Paul went off very impressed by this whole thing and proceeded to preach a version of Christianity which he had invented himself. And this version says that Jesus died on the cross in order to save mankind from the sin of Adam, from original sin, and that if you believe in Jesus, you'll be okay. Jesus never said anything of the sort. There's a lot of total nonsense invented by St. Paul. Now, what actually happened is very interesting. Uh, in fact, the Jews rose up against the Romans. The Romans sent their legions under Titus, and they knocked down the Jewish temple. They massacred the Jews at Masada, and that, more or less, was the end of the great Jewish revolt. Now, it was also the end of the Essenes and their rebels. They were all wiped out. And so, who was there left to propagate Christianity? St. Paul. Now, the Essenes detested St. Paul. They referred to him as the spouter of lies because they felt this whole nonsense about Jesus dying on the cross for the sins of men um, should, was worthy of some really terrible punishment. But St. Paul's version went on to win. Now what happened was that two centuries later, the Emperor Constantine, who was in fact a worship, worshipper of the sun, Solar Invictus, suddenly realized that his empire was getting beyond all bounds. It was far too big for any emperor to look after. And so, what he did was to ask two other emperors to take over the distant parts of the empire. And that didn't really work because the empire was too big. Then he had an inspiration. He thought, a lot of my subjects are Christians. And ever since Nero... We Roman emperors have been wiping them out as a bloody nuisance. Now, since I've got approximately one in ten Christian subjects throughout my empire, supposing I become a Christian too, suddenly I've got, so to speak, one in ten soldiers for me, people who are lawgivers and who are looking after me. And so, this clever Constantine declared that Christianity was from then on the religion of the empire, carefully himself remaining a worshipper of Solar Invictus. He never became a Christian. And from then on, Christianity took on the sort of role that it has gradually assumed down to today, including the Catholic Church and the lot. Now, one thing I didn't mention earlier about, about uh, the priest Beranger Sonier is that when he died, 
The priest who came in to take his final confession refused to give him absolution. Whatever Sonier said shocked him so badly that he wouldn't forgive him his sins. Now, it seems fairly certain to me that what the priest was told in point of fact was that Sonier had discovered that a movement in France of kings dating back to a king called Dagobert I in about the 4th century AD. Um, this movement, in fact, who were the true kings of France and who had been displaced um, by the revolt that finally um, got rid of their whole generation, continued to exist in the form of rebels who wanted to put um, the descendants of Dagobert back on the throne. What were they called, darling, the descendants of Dagobert? Merovingians. Merovingians. Sorry, my brain's going after two hours talking. I'm 70. You know, H.G. Wells used to say, sorry, brain gone. <laughs> and stop. And mine is getting a bit that way. Anyway, let me just finish this. Um, what seemed fairly certain to Lermas and Knight was that in point of fact, we were dealing with a movement which dated back not only to the Essenes but far beyond them, and that the Freemasons basically knew this secret. And this secret, which had so profoundly shocked the priest, was that Jesus was not the founder of Christianity because he died on the cross for our sins by producing the vicarious atonement, but that basically it's simply been an ordinary man. You see, Jesus himself would have been deeply shocked at the idea of being the Son of God. I mean, for him, this would have, as a, an Orthodox Jew, have been blasphemy. It seems almost certain that we are talking about a tradition that dates back a very, very long way. And that what the, Essene, what the um, Templars were looking for in the basement of the Temple was in fact certain documents from the Essenes which almost certainly showed them the way across the Atlantic to America when they got thrown out of France. Documents that showed in fact a civilization which knew about the world itself. Hapgood's worldwide maritime civilization which he'd written about in Maps of the Ancient Sea Kings. Uh, so what we are talking about, in fact, is a tradition that dates back a long, long way. How long? Well, the Freemasons talk about the Flood. And we know, of course, that the Flood probably occurred in about 9600 AD. And that it destroyed Atlantis. Uh, sorry, B.C., yep. I told you my brain's gone. But that this, in fact, was the solution to the whole mystery. That you've got an enormous tradition dating back that far. And that this is the answer to the problem of what Beranger Saunier discovered and the answer to where the Freemasons came from. You must, by the way, read The Hiram Key because it's the most incredible, extraordinary book. And there's far more in it than I've been able to tell you now. Uh, and in fact, this great tradition of the Essenes and the Templars and the Freemasons still continues to today, although the Freemasons themselves no longer understand what it is all about. Now, as I say, I set out at the beginning of this book trying to solve that problem of Hapgood's, when Hapgood said that he was convinced that civilization was 100,000 years old. I am convinced that Karl Hergesheimer had discovered the basic solution. And so is my friend Stan Gooch when he says that he was a Neanderthal man who had a culture which is far higher than anything we can understand nowadays. You should get hold of his book City of Dreams in which he talks about all of the archaeological and astronomical evidence for this. It is almost certain that it was Neanderthal man who discovered the procession of the equinoxes. And so, in point of fact, we are talking about this enormously long tradition dating back such a long way. Now, all of that I put into the end 
of the Atlantis blueprint. All of this, to my horror, has been cut out by Rand when I received the proof of the Atlantis blueprint because, obviously, he felt that he was taking away from his own tiny little sphere a belief that, in fact, all of the sacred sites of the world are placed on a geographical mesh and that, basically, what I was saying about Carl was, he felt, you know, in some way, undermining his own point of view. Now, I'm going to write a new book in which <laughs> I'm going to talk about all this stuff. And by the way, before we stop, I hope you let me go on for a couple more minutes. Um, one more very interesting thing, which I think will finish this off very nicely indeed. When Hapgood retired, he became deeply interested in a book called The Secret Life of Plants, which is about a man called Cleve Baxter, who discovered that when he was about to burn um, the leaf of his rubber plant with a cigarette lighter, and it so happened that he connected the rubber plant up to a lie detector, the rubber plant suddenly, the graph leapt like that. And he realized that the rubber plant re recognized that he was about to burn it and reacted exactly as a human being's graph would if you put a lighter near their face. Now, Hapgood became deeply interested in this whole question of, you know, plants being able to read our minds, because that's what it amounts to. And he came across an Indian called Chandra Ghosh, who'd gone even further than that. She became Sir Chandra Ghosh, Bose, sorry, B-H-O-S-E. And Bose had not only become fascinated by plants and their strange activities, because he'd carried out similar experiments. One day, an English physicist came to see him, and um, Bose showed him a graph a chart and said, what do you think this is? So the physicist sh shrugged in a bored way and said, well, I've seen it again and again. It's a simple graph of muscular fatigue. And Bose said, yes, but it applies to copper. He'd shown that when you, in fact, place copper under stress, it behaves exactly like human muscles. Metals are alive too. Now, um, his amazing results, which came out around the turn of the last century, have all more or less been forgotten, but you will find them in this book, The Secret Life of Plants, uh, by Christopher Bird. Now, Charles Hapgood became fascinated when he met a hypnotist who was able to regress people back to previous existences because it all seemed to be so completely authentic. And having once again studied this in his usual scientific way, he then himself began to try hypnotizing his students and getting expert hypnotists to do it, but he tried a very interesting thing. Instead of asking them questions about their past, he tried asking them questions about the future. With one of his students, having placed him in hypnotic trance, he said, um, where are you going to be next Wednesday, Dan? And Dan described in great detail what, he was, what he'd done on Wednesday, which hadn't yet arrived. He was going out to the local airport, and he described the way that he'd been told some amazing stuff about an earlier air crash. And then he described the way that he'd gone away, got terribly drunk in a bar with a couple of married ladies who tried to seduce him. And he became sort of terribly, um, terribly embarrassed and blushed like mad as he told about all this. I wouldn't go on. So he was wakened up. And the following Wednesday, Hapgood said, Ha, ah, Dan, I know where you were last night. And Dan said, where? And he said, well, you went to the airport and so on. He said, and then you ended your evening in a bar by getting drunk with these two ladies. And Dan looked at him with astonishment and said, how did you know all this? And he said, you told me under hypnosis. And Dan said, I didn't tell you what the ladies said, did I? <laughs> and Hapgood said, no, you didn't. And Dan said, hoof, thank God for that. Now, Hapgood did this several times, and he proved you could make people see the future under hypnosis. <laughs>
just like my friend Mark Breeden, who was driving along, um, I forget whether I mentioned this this evening or at lunchtime, but Mark was driving along Queensway when suddenly he knew that a taxi would shoot out um, and hit them at the intersection of the traffic light. And he wondered whether to tell his taxi driver that this was about to happen and decided the taxi driver would think he was nuts. And a taxi driver shot the lights and hit them sideways on. And he said that he just happened to be in a deeply relaxed condition because he was a pianist and had just finished giving a concert and was totally relaxed and his mind was wide open and that's why he could see the future. Now that means that all of us human beings have this peculiar capacity to see the future. What it means, as Hapgood discovered towards the end of his life, was that in fact we possess all kinds of paranormal powers. And this was another reason why Rand cut all this stuff out of the end of the book. <laughs> now, I'm going to put it back in the next book, and what's more, I'm going to tell, tell this story in full in the book. Um, I must ask you, by the way, not to talk about it too much, because you'll spoil the sales of the paperback. <laughs> okay, that's my lot. In, in your book, you mentioned briefly the, the, Sh the Schumann resonance. Oh, yeah. Mm. Um, I've heard that it's, it, this, this Schumann frequency up until 10 years ago was very, very stable at about 7.85 hertz. It's now rising rapidly. It's about 11 or 12 at the moment. Is it? So I'm told, yeah. And it's due to rise even more. I was wondering whether you had any more information about that. Uh, this um, Schumann frequency is the basic frequency of the vibrations of the Earth itself. And uh, a friend of mine who wrote a book about the Great Pyramid is absolutely convinced that the pyramid is a giant resonator and that this is why it was created. So I'm very interested but rather terrified to hear that the frequency is actually increasing. It obviously means some terrible catastrophe. I should add I don't believe that for a second. <laughs> Did you, did you know, uh, are you familiar with Sekely's material of the Dead Sea Scrolls that he got out of the locked uh, libraries of the Vatican? You would find it most interesting because um, the knowledge that we are talking about, that the Essenes collected, was actually given to Moses at the beginning of the, the, the exodus from, from Egypt and was then sent by his brother Aaron to people in the Far East to keep it and many, many hundred years later when the Essenes started to settle in Qumran they made it their business to collect back from the Far East all that material and uh, put it together with the Dead Sea Scrolls which they put in the caves because they knew they were going to go be uh, invaded every moment now by the Romans. Most That's amazing fascinating. Stuff. No? I didn't know any of this stuff. Please give it to me and I'll use it in this next book. <laughs> Sekely is the name. Robert Sekely, I think you'll, you'll find you oh. can get it quite easily. Okay, thanks. Nobody else? Can I go home? <laughs> <laughs>